you have a million dollars of life insurance and you die. Okay. Your wife gets the million dollars. Yes. You've paid for this money or you paid for this life insurance policy with after tax money. Mm -hmm. So your wife receives a million dollars tax free. Okay. But your estate, because you own the policy on yourself, mm -hmm. you're the owner includes the million dollar death benefit as part of what you own. Mm -hmm. And now you own a million dollars worth of life insurance that you don't have okay. as it went to your wife. And you have more than a million dollars of other stuff. And the state of Oregon says that's potentially taxable. Welcome to the True Well Show. On this the greatest Tuesday you have had all week. <laughs> I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. Joining me as usual, Matt Dixon. And have we got, I always say, that, have we got a show for you? Like it's somehow, uh, one, it's a radio show. Two, um, is it a show? Sure, infotainment. We're going to go with that. Um, but anyway, we we come with Ready to Rock. And we've got uh, the show today, Money in Motion and Expensive Mistakes. Oh, well, let's not make those. Right? Expensive mistakes. We had this uh, discussion, uh, and what, what sort of drove it, if I'm really candid, is we're, we're nearing tax deadlines. Here we are, already into the first week of March. You wouldn't know it if you looked at the snow this morning, but um, it is You know, I made a joke us. about that when I saw everything bloom in late February. I'm and you're like, like oh, uh, it's time for well, fall, spring. Oregon hates um, when you get ahead of yourself. And so I think we are just destined for it where I'm like, you know what? We're going to get some snow because why bloom? I'm pretty really sure nice. too, like there was a, like I made a bet in the office too. It was sunny and I said, no, nope, you wait, it's going to snow. And everybody's like, no, and I'm like, ah, yeah, sure what is it? Was just have this hunch. So sure enough, we got a little snow. But um, uh, the mistakes with money in motion, what? Yeah, you were kind of well. About no, how we're getting close to tax season, and uh -huh. so as we run up across deadlines, uh, I think it's always a good opportunity to look at this. Okay. And uh, the other is that call it a um, you know one of these times where every now and then I have to kind of regroup and think to myself, what exactly do financial advisors bring to the table? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the the context of this is uh, first. I think the real thing that they bring to the table is second set of eyeballs and they should be doing the job, right? It shouldn't be, Oh, they sold me something and I never heard from them again. Right. That's not doing the job. Right. But, uh, the, the issue runs into if you can't do the job or won't do the job personally, then you start looking for where do you get help and you can look everywhere for it. And I guess maybe I'm a little sensitive to this one, uh, being compared to Vanguard. Yeah, right? I get a little sensitive getting compared to the Vanguard and the no load mutual funds of the world, which are exactly what they're supposed to be a low cost way to access investments, mm -hmm. which is a great way to access investments, certain right? investments. If yeah. you can, if you, if you have the choice between high cost and low cost, I choose low cost every mm -hmm. time, right? Why carry an anchor? Okay. But I don't think it tells the whole story because right. largely speaking, you can't get financial advice. and Or you're going to call a 1-800 number and you're going to get someone different every time that really doesn't know your set of circumstances. Not just that. that. Yeah. For liability management purposes, the advice is going to be put inside of a box and they're only going to work within certain parameters because one. they can't afford to go outside that box. If you're a company that has trillions of dollars, you also have lots of liability exposure. So you figure out ways to limit your liability Correct. by limiting what they're allowed to tell yeah, you. Yeah, you limit the scope of the engagement mm -hmm. so as to limit your liability. Perfect. Yeah, okay? that makes sense. And so therein is one of the challenges, right? Is that you really are forcing somebody into the do-it-yourself category. I'm not opposed to doing it yourself. For everybody out there listening, I'm not here. In fact, what we're going to do today is we're going to unpack and, and discuss some of the common mistakes or misunderstandings that we see as financial pros. Okay? I like it. So I want to talk to you about what are things that I see? Maybe you know about these things, in which case, high five, you're not going to make this mistake. Maybe you learn something. But what I can tell you is some of the things that we're going to talk about today, if you unintentionally do some of these things, 
that mistake could cost you more than a lifetime worth of paying for financial advice. Extremely expensive. And that sounds like a, a bold statement. Yeah. But you're really not wrong. No, it sounds hyperbolic. It can, it can cost pretty easy thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And okay? I'm sure you've seen multiple hundred thousand dollar mistakes in your career. So I have seen expense. I, usually what I see is after the fact. Somebody comes and goes, well, this happened. Now mm -hmm. what? And it's already happened. Right. Because they're coming to you and saying, how do we fix this? Or right. Or like, what do I do moving forward if it's not fixable? And, and therein lies the issue too, is sometimes it's not fixable. Undone. Right. Yeah, some bells you can't unring. So we have. Can you give me an kind example? Of all or do you like? Should we oh, start out with an example? Of I can, like a really it? expensive one. Okay, here's a, a, an example. I'm I'm glad that this never happened to any of my clients, but uh, this is based on real story. We, the names will be changed to protect the innocent. So a person did this before, and it's a disaster, right? Okay, they're doing an estate plan. Okay, and they think, hey. I'm going to create a trust, mm -hmm. okay? And there's a lot of, we'll talk about trust some today, but there's a lot of misnomers around trusts and what they can and can't do, okay? But they created a trust because they wanted to direct their beneficiary interests and direct how things would occur. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things they were told is that you need to- Kind of like maybe retitle assets or something? Well, retitling is how you fund a mm -hmm. trust, right? That's yeah. what it's called. So retitling assets is making the trust be in charge of them. But somehow they got it in their head that their retirement plan, their IRA needed to be in their trust. Okay. Now, here's probably what happened, but then here's what here's probably what they thought was going to happen, but here's what actually happened. They thought, oh, I need to put my IRA in the trust. And what- was likely intended is people I, aren't going to squabble over. Well, no, gets I need to put the beneficiary of my IRA. I need to make the beneficiary of my IRA my trust, and my trust has instructions for how to dis mm -hmm. distribute the money. Sounds like a good idea on paper. But yeah, well, mm -hmm. and it is an okay idea when appropriate, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But what they actually mm -hmm. did was they retitled their IRA in the name of the trust. So the beneficiary was the trust? No, they accidentally liquidated their IRA and put all the money oh. in their trust ah. and didn't understand that that was a taxable event. Gotcha. And they had a multi hundred thousand dollar IRA and they triggered a multi hundred thousand dollar tax bill when they did it. Wow. Because they found themselves going from, oh, I make, this was, you know, decades ago when the story was told. So, you know, 20 years ago, they say, hey, I was making $50,000 and I cashed out a million dollar IRA. And then I had to pay taxes on a million dollars and it cost me $450,000. So yeah, they efficiently, you know. They officially made, gave up yeah. half their retirement plan because of a mistake in titling. Wow. Right, because of a misunderstanding, they made that mistake. And the issue is, once it came out of the IRA, it can't just they had constructive yeah. receipt. When they discovered it, it was past the 60 day mark and they could not undo it. And so it was a terribly expensive deal. It ended up in court. The advisors were involved and other people were involved. It was not good. That's bad. Not good. Yeah. So that was such a simple administrative fix. Had it, I mean, not, not fix. It would have been simple like to accomplish avoidance. administratively mm -hmm. with no tax consequence. But instead, because somebody, you know, put tab B in slot A instead of tab A in slot B, they melted the whole thing down. Wow. Right. And you're like, what? Yeah, it was serious. Hmm. So anyway, and I think they were under 59 and a half when it happened. They had a 10 percent oh, penalty, so penalty and everything. it just blew up too. everything. It Ooh. was just a catastrophe. So. That's a real life example. And if That's you a find yourself to recover from, like you worked your whole life to get to this point where things are going to be okay yeah. and you make a mistake and now they're not. It was a pretty massive errors and omissions claim, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, so easily avoided. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm okay. We are not sharing these to terrify you. No, that is not the point of this. I'm to not trying to scare people. you on any yeah. of this stuff. It's to say, Hey, uh, did you know, mm -hmm. first of all, and if you're saying like, oh, yeah, I knew that. No big deal. It really shouldn't be a big deal. This was an unforced error, though. Right. So that's and the I think thing. we're going to talk about a lot of different examples. We're going to have a lot of examples case. of unforced errors today. 
Um, I, we have a we have a series of rules in our office, though, and, and number two on the list is don't guess. And I think that's what happens is like, do you really know the answer or do you figure you know the answer and you're actually just pretty confident in your guess? That's that's that's, that's a real thing, right? It's like, oh, I, you know, oh, I know the way. And then you get lost and you're like, I guess I didn't know the way. Mm-hmm. Right. Some of those things are recoverable, but not every one of them. Right. Right. So that's the thing is that when it's really important, we don't guess on that kind of stuff. Or you shouldn't guess. So like that. Uh, anyway, that is a, a good example out of the gate. So we're going to go through some of those and some of the common misnomers today. Mm-hmm. Okay. So misnomers are things that people, it sounds right, but it isn't. Right. Okay. So like, oh, this is, well, that's common knowledge. That's common sense. Really? Because it's a common mistake. So we want to unpack some of those today. But uh, why don't we do this since we're. It's a it's a good time. We'll, we'll it's a it's a shade early, but I want to set us up for these, right? Um, I want to talk about some. Here's the first easy, like super cheap but super expensive. Even make a mistake. Who gets what when? Let's discuss it further. But let's take our break first. Welcome back to the True Well Show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. Yep. That's, yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was, I was like, wait, wait, wait. Normally he says, we're going to co-hosting with me. Um, remember, you can grab a podcast of this one. I'm not sure if the radio station's got it back up yet, but we are still posting these. So go to littlejohnfs.com and you can get the podcast. Um, and they're still showing up on video and all that. Yeah. Uh, we keep adding more technology and trying to make these things better. So uh, we'd love the feedback. If you check them out, leave us a comment. If you got questions, hit us up. We were talking about, at the break, mistakes that people make. Right? Yeah. So if you're just tuning we in. left them off on this whole, like, when. Well, who, what, when, where. Yeah, there you go. Right? And the idea here is, for, for those of you, again, if you're just tuning in, right? And if you stuck with us, awesome, thanks. But if you're just tuning in. People make mistakes with their money all the time, mm-hmm. right? And some of these are super easy to avoid. So we're just talking today about some of the things that we see a lot and how you can potentially avoid some of these mistakes. Uh, keep in mind, all of these are things that a financial professional should be able to help you with, yeah. right? Everything that we're going to talk about should, should be things that they know. That's the key word, should. Should. Not all of them are... Yeah, some of these are more advanced topics than others, right? right. Uh, uh, this is a chance. I'll toot our horn for a minute. One of the things I appreciate about the way we do business at Little John Financial is we operate as a team, mm-hmm. which gives us multiple perspectives on a problem. I, I think that can be really valuable because I don't know if you've ever done what I've done, I imagine, is I'll proofread something and it'll look right to me. And somebody else will go, no, this whole thing's wrong. Right. And then I look at it and go, my goodness, that's true. Well, and as a financial <laughs> advisor, sometimes you have to get creative, right? Sure. And so three people... Three financial advisors can be looking all at the same thing. And then one of them has the brilliant idea. And it's like, wow, that's a perfect thing to do in this given situation. Sure. And other times it's just confirmation. Yep, I see it too. Mm-hmm. So the, the whole point, though, is, again, I, I know I'm tooting our horn a little bit right here. You like the team approach. I like the team mm-hmm. approach because it's not like we have a your client, my client thing. Like we have fighting our client. Right, because then it even gets weird for the person who's you know, doing business with that firm because they don't want to step on people's toes. Yeah. There's a whole etiquette to it. Well, whose customer is it? Mm -hmm. So we just look at this and say, let's just solve the problem. Yeah. And it's our responsibility to sort out behind the scenes, how everybody feels warm and fuzzy in our office. As long as our clients are happy, we know we're headed the right direction. If you went to a car dealership and (laughs) the salesmen weren't on commission and it's like, yeah, you know, you probably would get a lot less of the high pressure settings. It, yeah, yeah. I, 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 it becomes a different experience, I'm sure. So let's get back to this question that the, the who, what, when, where. Okay. okay. Who are we talking about? What kind of stuff when you need to give it away to somewhere else? So right. Like the conversation of when is it appropriate to gift stuff? Well, let's give it more simple than that. Okay. Someday stuff that you have may not be yours because either you need to or want to give it away. Or because you did, Mm -hmm. right? It's a really weird one. It's not real fun to talk about, but we all kind of get it. And the older you get, the more you wise up to the fact that, you know what? Uh, The goal is to have as great a ride as possible, but it does come to an end. Well, death and taxes are a given. So how do we navigate those? Yeah. So these are some of the things that we see as mistakes as people are planning for how to transfer stuff when they die. Okay. Okay. 
one of the things is, did you update your beneficiaries? Okay. A beneficiary audit is another fancy term for this. What's a beneficiary? The person who's receiving the stuff when you die. Yeah. It's a real the person who will benefit, right? Yep. Beneficiary benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the connection in that word. And so, yes, you're going to die. Or if you're going to write some kind of estate instructions in the form of a trust or a will, the beneficiary it's, gets the and stuff. I bet you the listeners right now are saying, wait a minute, why would I have the wrong person listed as the beneficiary? Because things, things in your change. life change. Here's examples. Mm -hmm. You get a divorce. Have you seen someone accidentally give all their stuff to their ex-spouse? So I have not personally. Okay. And, you know, because that's one of the things that we have on sort of our follow up like list pay attention yeah. list is but hey, you've probably seen it in other you know it, areas. the stories are real and the case law says the, it goes to where it goes so if the ex-girlfriend ends up getting Ooh. the life insurance because you forget to change it Ooh. that really happens Ooh. yeah or the ex-wife or whatever or the ex-husband you know those That's are those can to, like, really happen out of the grave and live for a few moments to try and resign stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so that would, hurt. that would be a biggie um, the other would be you have um, scenarios like like a child is born, okay, right, or the beneficiary you had dies, right, right. So you the the person you thought was going to get it, Ooh, they're not could, there that anymore. That could cause an interesting one if they're not around to receive anything. Um, maybe it goes to the court system and ends up in probate. Well, there's a whole process for how that can potentially occur, mm -hmm. but the issue is. When you have things like retirement accounts with specific stated instructions for who gets the money, yeah, those are pretty clean. But if the instructions have no person associated with them, then it ends up going into your estate. And if your estate has no instructions in the form of a trust then or a will, then it goes into statutes, right? There's laws for how it gets distributed. And if you go far enough out, you can find no known heirs. You know, in theory, it could even sheet to the state. Mm -hmm. That's a, a weird term, right? But it just means that, you know, they'll ultimately take the money if they can't find anybody to give it to. It's a long process to get there. Slow process. Right. But yeah. So here's another one that people don't think about. What if you have minor children and then at some point they're not minors anymore? But they're not quite at the age where you're necessarily confident you they're going to make good decisions with the money. You just gave your 19-year-old a million-dollar IRA, a house, and your Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, well, or you know, the, or a million dollars and a house and your, you know, truck, and then at 19 years old they want a Ferrari, and so they and so they cash yeah. out the IRA, pay tons of taxes, and basically make some reckless decisions and blow through all of that. Because they just weren't ready when you could have right. structured it differently to where they got it when they were ready or got part of it now and some right. of it later, you know, just taking a better approach and you didn't. Yeah. So, okay. so that's one of those two is just beware of your beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Here's another thing that we see sometimes. The state of Oregon is an expensive state to die in mm -hmm. because what the state says is if you have more than a million dollars associated to your name, then we want a percentage of everything above a million dollars. Now, the good news is if you're married and you properly structure things, and I say that because you can improperly structure things and, and then you don't get this, right? You get a million dollars between both husband and wife. Right. Right. In, in the scenario of you've got, you know, you die and you don't structure right. So you get one million dollar exemption. But normally, with some basic instructions in a will or in a trust environment, which, you know, again, let's get back to trust and say, but, but in that environment, you can properly drafted double from a million to $2 million of exemption. Right. And that becomes a huge deal because, I mean, easy money. That's $100,000 of tax savings. It's roughly 10%. It's so a little less than that. It's about 10% of everything over a million dollars. The state wants a piece of that. That's an easy example of a six figure mistake. Yes. So, you, you know, I don't want to put a will or a trust in place because it's going to cost me two, three thousand dollars. OK, well, when you die, it'll cost you a hundred, you know, an extra hundred thousand dollars at least. Right. And people say, you know, well, I don't care. I'm dead. I don't need it. 
It's like, well, well uh, really, okay. But, but then <laughs> that means you don't care about your heirs. Yeah, well, a, a lot of the time people also, they don't, no act like that behavior is real because, well, I'm saving all this money because I don't want to pay the taxes. Mm-hmm. But when I die, I'll pay the taxes. I'm like, huh. That's a, that's a weird mindset. It is. You know, especially because that's you might be able to. That's a generational wealth mindset. That's the problem. Yeah. And, and you might be able to give money away on purpose. Sounds crazy, but that, that might work out better for you. Just. Yeah. yeah, or you might just be able to spend it and have a little bit better time and spend your estate down and, and enjoy it in lifestyle. Right. And That's, not have the tax problem. There's another example of some, you know, strategy involved, strategic gifting. Uh huh. If you have a large estate and you don't mind having the heirs receive some of it while you're still alive, you could gift down your estate to where, you know, you get down into a more manageable window where the estate taxes are less. Right. Now, here's the real question. Can you, so, so there's some real misunderstandings around gifting. The first mm-hmm. one is, what could you mess up if you're giving stuff away? Well, if they want to sell it and you gift it to them, they could inherit your original cost basis. So, All right, Matt, so, so I, I, I set there. Matt up I'm for this, them. by the way, because it's like, I didn't say what we're gifting, right? Yeah. If we just gift cash, what happens? Well, it's just cash. Right. And guess what? The recipient doesn't have to pay taxes for getting that cash. Right. That's a real common misnomer. I was going to the mistake. The mistake could be what if it's real estate? Well, the mistake could be what if it's any asset that's highly appreciated? Yeah. I mean, right? Yeah. You bought a house for $20,000 back in 1930. And that same place is. Well, you're, you're 90 something years old now. Good job. You're yeah. 94 and you're giving away a house yeah. that you bought when you were zero years old. Yeah, they, well, okay. I love the math. Of it. <laughs> like, all right, so maybe not that old, but yeah, you got a really highly appreciated asset, super cheap house that's worth a million bucks now. Yeah. All of those taxes go with the gift. Exactly. Yeah. So that can be a huge one because, because what's the difference? What happens if somebody, you, you, rather than receiving it as a gift, you receive it as an inheritance? Then what happens? Well, then you get the step up if you inherit it. So it can, on the can, date can of death. Can you explain to our listeners yeah. what, what the step up means? Yeah. So when you died, if it was worth, say, a million dollars at that point, you your cost basis is a million dollars. So if it goes up from there to, say, $1.2 million, now your gain is only $200,000. Okay. So what what I believe, just for everybody listening, right? if you buy something for super cheap, and then it's worth a whole bunch more one day and you sell it, you get taxed on the growth. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you've owned it for longer than a year, you pay long-term capital gains, which are cheaper than owning it for less than a year, where you basically pay the same tax as if it was income. Yeah. Because we've talked on the show before, but income taxes are higher than, than profit taxes on capital gains. The issue would be if you if you receive something when you in, when you inherit something, right? It's like you bought it that day. Mm-hmm. So you don't have the original price of the person that you're inheriting it from. That's yeah. what we call a step up in basis. Okay, and it's it's a really important thing when you're planning what things to give away, right? Because you can give away highly appreciated assets to a nonprofit, but you may not want to give away a highly appreciated asset to an heir necessarily, if given because the nonprofit doesn't worry about taxes, right? They just yeah. take it and they're like, great, thanks. And so they're, they're, that's, that's a whole different area of financial planning. Right. Well, so yeah, sometimes sometimes people don't attention. think about it this way too. The person that's inheriting, maybe they don't want to sell it. So it doesn't actually matter. If they plan to just keep that asset because they love it and they have no intention of ever selling it, yeah. maybe it is okay to give it away, even though the Absolutely. cost is really low. Absolutely. If you're the, the, the multi-generational family farm that's yeah. supposed to stay in the family forever, in fact, you may want to gift it to them. So it's like, you don't want to sell that. The taxes will crush you. And you're like, mm-hmm. you're right. I don't. I'll keep owning it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's a way to get it off of your balance, balance sheet. sheet. So yeah. you're not, you're not paying a state tax on it now too. Yeah. Right. But again, so, I mean, for the person in Oregon that has over $2 million worth of stuff, with a family, uh, right? Yeah, Individual, family, it's yeah. a million bucks. Right. But yeah, for, a family. So for that family, that's a really important piece that I feel like a lot of people overlook. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things that good planning and, and there are estate planning attorneys 
There are financial planners that can help with estate planning, but but good planning can save lots of money, a lot more than it costs, mm-hmm. right? And the, the biggie is for most of us out there, you're not likely to come across this. These rules are going to be complicated and they're unfamiliar because how often do you die? Once, right? And you shouldn't remember it. So... <laughs> Exactly. Got him. I got him. Yeah, I I was having to hold myself back there. So there are some other mistakes that we see a lot. You Um, you mentioned life insurance, I think, when we were um, back at the studio or the office, I guess, trying to prepare for things. Do you want to talk about life insurance in any way on how that can be structured, maybe in a way that I I do? I want to make one last comment on trust real quick. Oh, we're kind of okay. hinting around at this, so we didn't go deep into it. Tremendous misunderstanding. You know, if I had to say one, let me ask you, what do you think is the most common thing that I hear from people about trusts? Oh, that you get to skip all the taxes. Yeah. It's really interesting. People are like, oh, well, if you create a trust and you don't pay any taxes. I dealt like, with this literally within the last two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely not. Yeah. Trusts do not bypass taxes. No. Uh, if that were the case... Everybody would have a trust, mm-hmm. right? Now, trusts can get things out of your estate, mm-hmm. uh, but they do not bypass taxes. And so are there ways to lower tax exposure? Sure. Well, and the trust can lower your estate tax. It can lower your estate that. tax exposure, but, right. but folks oftentimes don't understand. If you create a trust and gift assets to it, and it's no longer in your estate, so you create an irrevocable trust, right? Yeah. That trust gets its own tax ID and its Here, own tax return. Here's one of my favorite ones, and I've, I've seen this too. I saw someone create a trust, and they're like, all right, so it's done. It's it's fixed. Everything's done. And I'm like, wait a minute. Did you retitle anything into the name of the trust? And they were like, no. And I'm like, okay. Yes. You, you, <laughs> Funding the trust. Because you know what? This is great. There's Let's, let's do this because we're a little long on the segment. We'll come back. I want to talk about life insurance. And some of the mistakes she's there. We and we'll talk, talk about some more trust. about the trust. What else are we going to talk about? Uh, really get people interested here. Well, Can here's we one of my favorites. Oh, we'll talk about real estate. Okay. Uh, what else? How about a, a really important Roth IRA gotcha? Ooh, ooh. Now I'm interested. Yeah. So so it'll be worth it. Stick around. We're, we're going to try to save you some money by, by avoiding mistakes. I like but we got to take a break. All right, gang. Guitar riff. Time to get back in here. Um, I'm Dave Littlejohn in studio today with me. Matt Dixon. And you got the True Wealth Show. Uh, we left people off on a big cliffhanger yeah. because we were talking about all this cool stuff that we're going to talk about in ways that we can potentially help them avoid a mistake. Yep. Where did Which one did we leave off on? Well, we were talking about trusts. We are talking about life insurance. I said there was some um, subtle mistakes that can be made with Roth IRAs that if mm-hmm. you um, if you, you make a misstep, you can cost yourself yeah. unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. So, um, you, you know, I think the last point we had was about trust that We're people kind of finishing that up. Yeah, you know, folks will get this kooky idea in their head, like, well, you know, rich people use a trust so they don't pay taxes. I'm like, that's not mm-hmm. real. We left off, I remember now. We were What's talking up? about people not transferring stuff back into the name of the trust or retitling assets. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you what do you mean? Like, well, first like, of all, what's retitling at, like what does okay, that mean? So like with your house, that might be titled in your name, but you could go down to the county if you have a trust and then tell the county to retitle the house into the name of the trust so that the house is owned by the trust, not by you. Because yeah. the trust will outlive you after you die. Yeah. Now here's where it gets a little funky. The house is owned by the trust. But you own the trust, so you're still yes. the owner. That's where a lot of people get disconnected. Yeah, with, right? and so people are like, well, I can't do that. I have a mortgage or something else. No, you typically still can mm-hmm. because there's two big kinds of trusts, right? There's the trust that you can change your mind on. We Ooh. call these revocable, yes. right? It's like, oh, you know what? I need to sell my house. I'm allowed to do that because I have a revocable trust. But there is me. irrevocable trust yeah. that you can't change. Why? in your opinion, is maybe not necessarily one is better than the other, but kind of describe two different scenarios for me where you might choose a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust. Yeah, so they do two different things, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm not a, I'm not an attorney, so I can't practice law. So what I'm going to give you is... But you can 
It's one of those like, hey, I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to give you a sense of how this works, but I'm going to remind you that ultimately for you to pick something appropriate for you, get the right advice and guidance, right? Don't mm -hmm. listen to some guy on the radio or some, you know, internet net guru without getting your specifics for your circumstance. But largely there's these two trusts. The revocable trust is something that you want to keep around for if you want it to stay in your possession mm -hmm. and you're in charge of it and you can make the decisions with it, you get the beneficial use of it. If so, you need to make changes yeah. along the way. Basically anything that you would normally just buy with your own money and title it in your own name or own it and use it in your own name is appropriate in a revocable trust because the trust is an extension of you. The magic is when you die, that trust will typically become irrevocable, mm -hmm. right? So it will convert from revocable to irrevocable so that when you're dead now, the trust doesn't die, but it sort of locks the options in place and then says, okay, now that I'm gone, I want you to start giving my stuff away to these people the same way a will would do it, yeah. right? Like a will. But the difference is a will, you have to go to the, to the probate process. And so the court system is going to authorize changing ownership of your assets, mm. right? A trust that owns assets authorizes the next person in line to sign on behalf of the trust. So it doesn't have to die. It can hand the pen to the person next in line, and then they can re retitle assets into the, the names of the people that are supposed to receive it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to work like a will in many respects, but it's not going to be required to go through probate. Okay. Okay. So it's it's a little more expensive to set up, but it's typically cheaper and easier to operate it later. Right. So it's, you know, okay. do you want to pay up front or pay on the back end? That's kind of a biggie. An irrevocable trust while you're still alive mm -hmm. is basically saying, I'm going to take this stuff out of my wallet or out of my household and I'm going to give it away. Like I'm going to put it here and it's no longer going to be considered my ownership. Right. An irrevocable trust is not something that I have beneficial ownership and use of any longer. Now, does that change things for estate tax purposes? It does, because mm -hmm. effectively it's like taking the money and removing it from your estate. You know, mm -hmm. if I had an irrevocable trust, it gets complicated here. And again, I'm not advocating for this, but a but lot of what time, we're trying to do is just say, hey, there are these option sets out there. They work kind of like this. You need to seek counsel if yeah. you find yourself in a situation where this yeah. might be applicable. It's, it can be useful because an irrevocable trust can own life insurance that can then pay estate taxes to keep stuff within your personal state and so forth. So it, it, there, there can be some reasons to entangle irrevocable trusts with what you're doing, but they're typically for pretty sophisticated stuff, pretty high dollar. Mm -hmm. um, but, but nevertheless, if, and here's what I'll tell you, look, this is going to sound crazy. If you're listening, a lot of you, a lot of us listening out there, you're going to go, huh, well, that'd be a great problem to have. And sure. But look, if your net worth as a either individually or as a as a couple, your net worth individually is over about 12, 13 million dollars. OK, or if your joint net worth is over about 25 million, then you start to want to look at these mechanisms to transition wealth and manage taxes. OK, okay? so. It is a it's a much higher net worth, more sophisticated strategy. And to which I would say, if that is you and you have that problem and you have not gone through this process, give us a call. Right. And and you know, we, we have a network of people and resources that we can turn to and can help you vet that. OK, I like that. Um, and if it's not you, then hooray that those are not. Uh, you, you know, they're, they're very first world problems. I have so much money. I'm trying not to give it all to the government. Okay. Well, let's, let's work on how to do that. But there are individuals out there that have that challenge. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there you go. And sometimes it happens through an inheritance. Maybe you didn't create it, but I've had scenarios where people were like, surprise, I didn't know grandpa was worth $60 million. Mm -hmm. And it was true story. And they're like, wow, we paid a ton in estate taxes and still had. Millions and millions of dollars that we inherited, and I have no idea how to use, you know, what to do with this now. And so then it's like, well, is it Ferrari or is it stewardship? Mm -hmm. And what if it's both? It may be possible you could do both, but if you don't know how to manage the money, get help. Yeah. Right. That's what I would tell you. Okay. Um, life insurance. Mm. Okay. 
What, what about life insurance? What, how do you want to take this conversation? I'm interested. Okay. So we already talked about beneficiaries. We did. There's a sneaky thing that happens in the state of, well, in, in really anywhere. Okay. It happens federally, but it's also going to happen at the state level. You wouldn't think it, but the death benefit of your life insurance may be part of your state. So you have a million dollar term life insurance policy. Okay. You well, die. Your term policy pays your spouse. So like, let's just keep the language straightforward. So are you a husband, about like if, if I have life insurance on myself, let's, then, all right. So let's just use you and your wife. Man. Okay. So, um, we you have a million dollars of life insurance and you die. Okay. Your wife gets the million dollars. Yes. You've paid for this money or you paid for this life insurance policy with after tax money. Mm -hmm. So your wife receives a million dollars tax free. Okay. But your estate, because you own the policy on yourself, mm -hmm. you're the owner, includes the million dollar death benefit as part of what you own. Mm -hmm. And now you own a million dollars worth of life insurance that you don't have because okay. it went to your wife. And you have more than a million dollars of other stuff. And the state of Oregon says that's potentially taxable. There's good news. The good news is that your wife is going to get an unlimited transfer of all of your stuff without paying any taxes. Mm -hmm. because that's the way the law works. The bad news is we've used up your million dollar exemption. And so now your wife gets, you know, that she right. has a million dollars. And if she dies, she because only has a million dollars worth of exemption because you didn't structure it properly. If the policy was in her name, she would have received a million dollars instead of the estate being. Well, let's be clear. With an unlimited marital transfer, mm -hmm. you can make your wife the owner of exactly. the policy that pays yes. when you die. Yeah. And then it kind of jumps right. through that. And then the, she gets the money as a result of the ownership she already had. Mm -hmm. So it was, so instead of a million dollars in your estate and now a million dollars in hers, you used up a million dollar exemption, right? You kept the exemption right. with the person that receives the money. And you're like, that's stupid. How could they do that? And I'm like, it is stupid. And it's how it works. But they don't care because if you do it wrong, they get more money. And so titling of life insurance, just like it titling matters. and trust, it matters. And this is one of those, if you've not messed with this stuff, how again, would you know? Yeah. Talk to your insurance person. Talk to your financial pro. If you don't have those, talk to us. We can help you do it. Mm -hmm. Right? But these are things where it's super low hanging fruit. It basically costs nothing to fix this, but it should be fixed, right? Because remember, not fixing this, if you end up with more than $2 million, it's a $100,000 mistake. And you're like, I had no idea. And the crazy thing is, a bunch of insurance agents don't even know. Really? Yes. Oh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a gotcha. So anyway, if, if you take only this one away today, Go look at who the owner is on the life insurance on you and make sure that it's not you if you're married. <laughs> right. Wow. That's a good one. Okay. Add Great. that, add that to the list. Listen. All right. And, and by the way, I would just put this caveat in here again. Speak to your financial professional and your tax pro about this stuff. Okay. Cause I can't give you advice on air because we're actual financial advisors. That's why I say if you're curious, call us. Here's what's crazy. We haven't even talked about all the mistakes surrounding a Roth IRA yet. We haven't. There's there's others. And look at the time. I know. We're the, yeah. So we'll do this. Remember, I can't give you financial advice, but I can tell you perk up and go pay attention to who owns your life insurance and make sure that it's dialed in. Okay. And uh, call us at 541-375-0898 if you don't know who else to call. Otherwise, uh, we're going to take a break because we got to take our last one. Right? All right. All right, gang, welcome back to the home stretch of the True Wealth Show. R&R, &R, Roth and Real Estate. Let's okay. go. So first, there's something on your mind, Matt. I could tell. So what are the things that um, you want to make sure in these final few minutes? Like, um, you tell so, I'm getting caffeinated. Uh, we, talk a, we could talk a little bit about, with in regards to real estate, just giving away your house um, at, at the wrong time. Okay. That's a possibility. To, you, this is real. I'm going to let you talk about it because you know exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, um, if you give it away, um, you could end up with a bunch of potential 
tax problems, right? This is back to, if you guys are just joining us, you missed yeah, earlier, we talked like about we capital gains. We talked about this a little bit. But okay. we didn't talk it's about- upon uh, on this a little bit. Yeah, well, so one of the reasons you might want to give your house away mm -hmm. is if they're, it's not supposed to get sold. That counterintuitive, but let's, let's think in terms of like, hey, we have a, a multi-generational family farm. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is relevant to me personally, right? Yeah. So I grew up and I think I'm seventh generation on the farm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of my brothers is likely to inherit this seventh generation farm that was homesteaded back in the 1800s. Oh, wow. Okay. And so nobody wants the farm to be sold, mm -hmm. including the brother that's planning to be there. And so it may be beneficial in the estate case to simply gift it to him now. Right, because now, he's not going to sell it. Because he's not going to sell it, right? And so it's like the, his cost basis is irrelevant, mm -hmm. but it could be really beneficial but, to to mom and dad mm -hmm. making the gift because it changes the estate dynamic. But if his intention was to sell it, then if it's gifted to him, he gets oh that cost God. basis gifted to him. Because how much did that sell for back seven generations ago? Well, it wouldn't you be know? like that. It would be how much did mom and dad have it for right mm -hmm. because they got it at some point so that's their basis true right because the basis is travel with it but the point still being over over a, a lifetime property appreciates a lot mm -hmm. and so that creates big tax exposure so that would be a scenario though where hey if the property's not supposed to get sold then there could be a strategic reason to gift it early mm-hmm Okay. And that's all about what planning is for. Remember, the idea is to avoid costly mistakes. And yeah. so, and, and I, I swear that's a big part of why you work with the pro, mm -hmm. right? Is if you don't know how to do these things, helping navigate this process, even if you're paying for it, should ultimately save you money. Right. Right. Because mistake avoidance, mistake, the, the most expensive thing I think most investors struggle it's with is just not knowing unforced errors yeah. and the cost of unforced errors. Absolutely. Right. I mean, we've all had, well, most of us, you can pick a bad investment and lose some money on it. It's going to happen from time to time where you can own an investment through a bad time and it, it will go down and it will be frustrating and maybe it recovers. Maybe it doesn't. That's why we use diversification and other things. But what about unforced errors? I mean, right? Yeah. Another one in regards to real estate, you could take your home residence that you've lived in, you know, for multiple years and turn that into a rental. Yeah. But if you go to sell it and you haven't lived there in the last, what is it? Two out of five years. Two out years? of five years. Yeah. So then, okay, now you're taxed differently. Right. You, you right. Know. You get the, the reason what Matt's talking about is your home, your primary residence if you've been in it for two out of the last five years and you sell it for a profit, you have a, an exemption from capital gains tax mm -hmm. up to $250,000 per person. So it's half a million dollars for a husband, wife, combo. Quite a bit. And so if that's the case, then you can have a lot of profit and not pay tax on it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't sell it, but instead convert it to a rental property and then you don't live in it for a little while, it could turn into a taxable property again because Yikes. it's not your residence. Yikes. So if you want the income and you want to own it long term, fine. But if you're thinking you might sell it in a few years, that's your window of time before the taxes come back mm -hmm. into the decision. So you need to be aware. I like it. Yeah. And so we are really basically out of time. Um, we Roth, didn't even talk about the Roths. No, I'll throw this out there super fast. Right? Okay. One of them is Roths need to be alive for five years before you get all the tax benefits. Okay. So start early so that you've got a five-year clock ticking for a Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. This is particularly relevant if you have a Roth 401k, because if you have no other Roth to roll it into and you retire, your five-year clock starts after you retire on the Roth portion of your 401k. Ooh, yikes. Yeah, it's kind of a sneaky one, or at least last I checked. So again, consult with your tax person to confirm that, but Roths can be a time bomb in that respect. Uh, the other one is Roth conversion. There's a tricky one called a backdoor Roth IRA. This is another one of those where if you make so much money, you can't have an IRA or, or sorry, you can't have a Roth IRA. There's still ways to have Roth IRAs. Isn't that weird? Yeah. You just, and I'll leave it at this, right? Talk to your financial pro about whether or not a, a, a backdoor Roth is appropriate for you. If you don't have somebody, give us a call, right? So Matt, how do they reach us? Uh, you can call or text 541-375-0898, or you can go email us at info at littlejohnfs.com, or you can go to our website, 
Uh, littlejohnfs.com. All right, so lots of ways to reach us. But again, yep. this would be the problem where you're phased out of Roth eligibility. You make too much money. Uh, so you're looking to still have a Roth. It's called a backdoor Roth IRA. We can help you with it. There's just some gotchas to make sure you don't overpay on taxes. Uh, but it, we're out of time for now. So until next time, uh, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN.